Hi everyone, welcome back to Five Code Shakespeare Othello. Today we're gonna to look at Act Four, Scene Two. What I do in this series is I first give you a nutshell overview of the important plot events of each scene, and then we dive deeply into the text of each scene and pull out five quotes that I think are useful to help you understand the play's character and themes. If you find these videos useful, please like and subscribe and consider making a small donation to my Patreon account. You were probably taught that narrative structure looks something like this with rising action, building tension up until a climax, and then we have the resolution. Um, it's not wrong, of course. It's pretty much right, but I think it's more accurate to think of it in these terms. Um, there's a series, most, most dramatic um, stories, narratives, movies, plays, whatever it is, they have all these little micro climaxes. There's this, this rising tension that reaches its little peak, and then there's a, a, a somewhat of a resolution, or at least a lull, do you see, before we get another micro crisis, before we approach the, the, the main crisis, which is the big climax. And in this play, of course, it's the bedroom scene where uh, Othello murders Desdemona. So where we are now is we're kind of, we're, we're, in, a, we're in a bit of a lull after a, a, a climax that had just happened. It's a very short lull because the climax builds rapidly again because we're approaching the end of a scene, uh, the, end of, the, the end of a play. When you approach the end of a play, by the way, that's where, the, that's where things really, really pick up. The pace starts to pick up. And so we, we are in this uh, approaching the major climax. But what we just saw in the previous scene, of course, was, was Desdemona's public humiliation very, very public humiliation. Her, she was slapped by Othello um, in front of everybody in Cyprus. And so we need some kind of, if not a resolution of that, we need, there, there are questions to be answered and we have to figure out what's going on. And of course, Othello, Othello has a lot of questions and Desdemona certainly has a lot of questions. So this is where we find ourselves at the beginning of Act 4, Scene 2. So let's have a look at the details. Othello questions Amelia. So this is, it's a quieter scene, you see. The previous scene that I just talked about with this microclimax was very, very public, very open, and very, very tense. And now the tension is still here, but it's, it's a quieter moment, so there's a bit of a lull. Othello questions Amelia about Desdemona's behavior with Cassio. He really starts to grill her. He says, you've never seen them alone. They've never asked you to leave the room. They've never whispered to each other, these kinds of things. And Amelia says, no, 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 you're absolutely wrong. She defends Desdemona's innocence. Desdemona then enters, and Othello accuses her of being a prostitute and Amelia of being her madam. I mean, this is as crude as it gets, and the dominant motif of this whole scene is this tension, this conflict, this juxtaposition of the base and the noble, the base and the noble, which is what we've been talking about for the entire play. And we see these, I'm gonna, I color them up, and you're going to see uh, it's like a salt and pepper all throughout the text of these two forces of nobility and, um, and, and, and baseness, and of course, uh, Desdemona is, is what is heavenly, and poor old Othello is what is now is base and associated with hell. So there's a corruption of the sacred marriage. The, the, the other motif, the other theme that runs through this entire theme is, is sex. It really is, and, and the crudest form of sex, which as I've said from the beginning of this, is the domain of Iago. Iago cannot understand human relations in any other way than, than mere animal, bestial, sexual contact. So here we see Othello accusing Desdemona of, of being a mere prostitute and Amelia not being a tender, caring friend, do you see, with any spiritual love for her sister, you know, her, her spiritual sister Desdemona. No, she's merely a seller of wares. Do you see how horrible that is? Do you see the corruption of that? Now that's not the true self. That's not, I'm gonna argue that that's not the true self of, of Othello at all. That's, that's Iago's voice speaking through him. That's the tragedy. As I mentioned, all through, we're going to trace throughout this scene that the antithesis, the juxtaposition, and the cognitive dissonance, the painful cognitive dissonance. He knows, Othello knows at the deepest core of himself, he knows that what he has with Desdemona is something sacred. And we're going to talk about the mythological aspect of, of the sacred marriage. He knows that that's what he has with Desdemona. But he's, he, his, his intellect has been poisoned. His, his mind has been poisoned. Down here he understands. But this has been poisoned. By, uh, by Iago and his insecurity allowed that to happen. And so that, that tension between those two forces within him tears him apart as we're gonna see. Antithesis, juxtaposition and cognitive dissonance ensue as Desdemona, the, the noble and the heavenly person, defends herself against Othello's charges, which is baseness and hell. And language here, you'll see, the way the language, I've colored it in red, the language that Othello uses versus the language that Desdemona, it's, it, you couldn't have a sharper contrast. Then Othello exits and Iago enters and tries to comfort Desdemona. And this is, you know, you know, terribly, terribly dramatically ironic because we know that Iago, we know that it, it was Iago's voice that we heard spewing all of this poison, do you see? And he's trying to now use sweet language to, to comfort Desdemona. 
very Emilia, I've talked before about Emilia. She's a very, very interesting character, very complex. She's not simple. She's no fool. She's, 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 she, she's, she emerges as heroic, but much, much too late. So a tragic hero. Here she argues that someone has lied to Othello. She's right on. She, she says that I, she, she's, she says, I'm certain that some, some mischief maker has, has poured poison into uh, Othello's ear and ruined Desdemona's reputation. She's right on. And what she's actually talking about is exactly who Iago is and what he has done. Now, Iago, it's very, very, Shakespeare leaves it open. And Shakespeare is, is a master of, uh, of not revealing very much, okay? Of, 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 he doesn't obscure things. He doesn't obscure things. He doesn't deliberately. He doesn't deliberately make things complex. All he does, as I've said before, is he holds the mirror up to nature and he says, no, here, here you go. Here's how you would encounter people sitting in a coffee shop listening to a conversation on the table next to you. That's all you see. And from what you see and hear is what you have to figure, figure out. You have to infer from, from what you see on the surface things that are bubbling underneath. So we don't, we're not quite sure if Emilia is openly accusing, or not openly, but subtly accusing Iago. We're not sure if she suspects Iago or not, but I, I actually my argument will be that she does. I think she does suspect Iago because otherwise she'd be stupid, right? Alone with Iago, and then we get this weird, a lot of scenes in this play, as you've noticed, have, have ended. There's, there's the main story happening here, and then he'll end, Shakespeare will end the scene with the bit uh, of Rodrigo and, uh, and Iago talking, and of course, Iago poisoning Rodrigo and stealing all his money and his lands and everything. Um, it's kind of a, it's just a plot mover. It just moves the plot forward. They're, they're not, it's not the, the main thrust. It's not the most interesting thing of the whole play, but there it is. Anyway, so... Every, all the heroes, all the, all the main characters leave, and Iago is alone with Rodrigo. And Rodrigo, of course, again is whining and complaining that Iago is using him. Well, duh, he has been using him from, from, from the very start. Iago, of course, and again uh, convinces the naive, gullible Rodrigo that he must kill Cassio to prevent Othello and Desdemona from leaving Cyprus. That's, what, that's what's going to happen. They're, they're, they've been called away from Cyprus, and Iago says to Rodrigo, it's her last chance to get... Desdemona, we have to prevent them from leaving. And if we kill Cassio, then Othello will have to stay in Cyprus because Cassio was supposed to take over the leadership of Cyprus from Othello. So a little bit of complexity there, but the interesting stuff is this psychological mess. As I mentioned, the scene opens with Othello and Emilia talking. Othello is grilling her on Desdemona's behavior with Cassio, and Desdemona defends her friend. Um, she says, if any wretch has put lies in your head, then let heaven requite it with a serpent's curse. So we know that that wretch is Iago. So there's some delicious dramatic irony there. Um, the, then Emilia leaves to go get Desdemona. And then Oth Othello alone introduces the dominant theme of the entire scene, which is the grotesque contrast between his new notion of love, okay, that, that is really Iago's, implanted in him by Iago, and his former notion of love, love as something spiritual and beautiful. So Shakespeare in a lot of his plays has explored this theme. Love is the redeemer, the healer, the spring of life, the font of life, the fountain of life. Now that's a sexual image as well. The fountain is a sexual image, but it's also a, a spiritual image as well. Um, without the union of male and female, you don't get new life. You don't get, the, you don't get rebirth. You, you, you know, <laughs> the planet will die if dogs don't have more dogs with other dogs. Do you see what I'm saying? It's, it's, the how, it's how the world works in nature. And humans have spiritualized that um, in, in a very beautiful way in many of our myths and, of course, are the stories that we tell ourselves today. Love is the true expression of the self. That's, that's the Romeo and Juliet uh, version. If you watch The Tempest, The Tempest has this love is the redeeming cosmic force. The union of opposites is a, is a cosmic force that must take place. Conversely, we've got Iago's notion of love, and in several other plays, too, there are crude characters who, who can only conceptualize uh, uh, human love in physical terms. And in, 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 in a lot of his sonnets, too, Shakespeare explored this theme. And in one of his sonnets, I can't remember the name of it, it, it he, he depicts mere crude love in very, very crude language. It's a, it's a, it's a brilliant sonnet, but, but it, 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 state, it lays out his thesis, I think, what he, what he, what he actually thought about love. Um, it comes from the old troubadour tradition as well. You can look up that. Anyway, uh, it's a corruption. Uh, the, what what the, the attitude and the notion that Othello now has in his mind is, is, is sex removed from love. 
any kind of spiritual spirituality whatsoever. It's a corruption of the grand theme of the sacred marriage. Now, I first encountered this when I was reading Joseph Campbell many, many years ago, and it fascinated me. Um, this is a, an old, old Christian Gnostic version of this, the, the, the heavenly union of opposites, the sacred marriage, the cosmic sacred marriage, the union of opposites, and it fructifies the universe. Fructifies means to give new life to. Rain on the earth fructifies the earth, and, and from the earth new life shall be born. Um, it's, it's, a, it's a lovely notion. It's, it's an old, old notion. It's a biological notion. It's, it ties us to the earth uh, in, in the most profound ways. And humans being humans, humans being symbolizing creatures, we symbolize that natural process, do you see? In, we build it into our myths and our stories. And we see it in Harry Potter. We see it in all of our love stories, all of these, you know, your twilight stories, anything that you, any, from the, from the highest art to the lowest art, you see this theme being told again and again and again and again and again. And here we see it here. Here's the, here's the sun, solar power. The solar energy is the mask, was conceived of as the masculine energy. The lunar power was conceived of, of the feminine power, and they must unite. And here they are in a fountain, and they must unite in a fountain, in the water somehow, because water is the place where life comes from. It springs forth. And without that union, you don't get the fructification of the universe. Uh, Shakespeare talks about it in The Tempest. Uh, Romeo and Juliet are the, the sacrificial heroes whose union, the male and female union, is what gives new life to Verona because it cures the wasteland and everybody's happy at the end. It's, it's a really, really cool old, old, old motif. And we see the corruption of it here. We see the tragic corruption of it. Othello had it. He was that hero. Desdemona and Othello were the, the, the lunar solar union of the cosmic world. They, everybody loved them. They admired them. They were the great couple. And because of the, because of the psychopathic machinations of, of Iago, he has now become its, its mirror opposite, its evil mirror opposites. So he sends Amelia away by, by again addressing her as, as the mistress, as the madam, as the, as the, as the woman who's going to sell. Um, you know, again, Iago is associated with money too, right? Oh, look at that. Isn't that interesting? From the beginning, get, put money in your purse, put money in your purse. That's Iago. Well, here we go with Othello has been incepted by Iago's ideas, and he thinks of Emilia as, as her function being that of the mistress collecting money from the, uh, the, the man who's coming to visit the prostitute. He says, leave procreants alone and shut the door. So the image, of course, is the John, the man who has paid for sex, has gone into the hotel room, and now he's going to have sex with this woman. The procreants... Is, is, is a term for procreation is what we just talked about. That's where procreation is happening. Babies are being made in the procreative process. Here, however, of course, it's crude and removed from all spirituality. Uh, very, very tragic. Um, it ties very, very nicely to our notion of, uh, of, of baseness versus nobility. That runs throughout the entire play, as we've seen and we're going to see. I mean, look at the blue and the red. I'm, I'm going to walk you through this now. The blue and the red is just all that language revealing the attitude of the, of, the, of the character. And, of course, it's Iago's voice that we hear when we hear uh, Othello speaking. Um, we see what we expect to see. Uh, if you have these poisonous thoughts in your mind, that's how you see everything. So he sees Amelia, Amelia not as a good friend. He sees her as a, a madam, a mistress. He sees uh, he, he has corruption in his mind. So he sees Desdemona as as a, as a prostitute. He's alienated from himself. He's not speaking for he's not speaking his own words. He's speaking Iago's. Do you see? That's that that was my argument throughout this entire series is that he has become alienated from his true self, which is indeed noble. The manipulation, the inception of Iago is what has allowed that to happen, do you see? And when that does happen, he is now, it's Iago can leave. He, he doesn't, you know, Iago doesn't need to be there anymore. Othello will destroy himself. The wheels are in motion and we, he, we, be, we are the agents of our own destruction. He will destroy himself. Iago can just sit back and watch and enjoy it. Emilia leaves and Desdemona takes a spiritual religious attitude by going down on her knees and associating herself with prayer and with the powers of heaven and, of course, with the powers of nobility. And that, of course, sets off the, uh, or that continues the, the, the theme of nobility versus baseness. She's associated immediately with the, pow with the, with the powers of good, do you see, the powers of heaven. Uh, the whole scene is kind of like a, it's kind of like a tennis match. There, there, there's, there's a back and forth here. There's a dialogue here. Uh, Othello accuses her. Uh, she responds, uh, defends herself, and then Othello accuses again. So what are you? I'm your loyal wife. What else would I be? Well, come on and swear it. I want you to swear that you're my loyal wife. If you associate yourself with heaven, then go ahead and lie because your lie 
will damn you double, do you see? Once you'll be double, you're, you're damned already because you've been dis disloyal to your husband, and now you'll be damned because you're perjuring yourself in the, in the, in the, in the eyes of heaven. So that kind of crude uh, back and forth goes on throughout the entire scene. Heaven knows that, that I'm honest. And here's a good example, by the way, if you need something for school, if you need uh, uh, an example of a tithis, antithesis, antithesis is actually quite obviously you begin in position A and you end in its opposite position, position B down here. So heaven truly knows that thou art false as hell. Now he's basing this on all of the things that we talked about in, uh, go back and watch my previous video, and I lay out the, uh, the manipulations, the inceptions that, uh, that Iago uses to, to, to plant this, to, to convince Othello that he's right. Uh, otherwise, I mean, he's, he hasn't he hasn't seen them at all, right? Now, what happens next is really really interesting. I'm false. You you are false as hell. To whom, my lord? To whom? How am I false? Now he can't handle this. Look what happens here. O Desdemona, away, away, away! And Desdemona's heart breaks, and she says, "Alas, the heavy day! Why do you weep?" He's cracking. He's cracking up here. And where's that coming from? It's the cognitive dissonance. As I mentioned before, he knows. He knows that she is truly this blue stuff. She is a heavenly, virtuous woman, uh, extremely so, perversely extremely so, we could argue. Okay, he knows it at, at his core, but, but he's, because of, of the, the, the incepted ideas from Iago, uh, he's, he's, he's at war with himself, do you see? So that way, he's trying to escape the torture of, of this, of, of not knowing. Why do you weep? Uh, and then, yeah, here, here's, here's where it gets really, here's where it gets into that, that mythic realm that we just talked about, the Gnostic Christian uh, union of opposites. He says, if heaven had decided to punish me with the cruelest punishments possible, poverty, shame, sores, rain down all the affliction as it could, I would bear it with patience. But, but, but there where I have garnered up my heart, where either I must live or bear no life, the fountain from which my current runs or else dries up to be discarded th thence or keep it as a cistern for foul toads to not engender in. So what he's saying here is that I could, take, I could bear all of, the, all of the, the pains and sufferings of physical existence except that I've put my heart somewhere. I love you. I loved you, and he still does, of course. I, that's where I put my soul. I put my spirit there. Do you see that? And it's 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 this thing. It's it's the true expression of the self. He has his whole worldview has been has 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 involved his his wife at the most profound and highest level possible. Where I have placed my heart, I must live there, knowing that you are pure and that you love me, and then we can be the heroes that fructify whose union fructifies the universe or annihilation or if that's not the case if that is corrupt then i i will die there's the image of the fountain the fountain from which my current runs my whole life comes from the love that we have together it's a really really beautiful conception of what a marriage should be the ideal marriage they were the ideal heroes do you see or else it dries up if, I, if it's not that, then my life has, my, the, the source of my life has dried up. He's, he's actually getting suicidal here. His whole worldview has been turned upside down. His whole sense of self has been turned upside down. And we saw that love is a true expression of the self in Romeo and Juliet, right? Where Juliet has to say goodbye to her parents because she has to choose to become who she is by choosing who it is that she, who she, by choosing the, by choosing the place, her own place to put her heart, do you see? And that's, 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 the, uh, that's an old notion of love, Western notion of love. Or is my love, is my love merely a cistern for foul toads? Now a cistern is just like a, 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 a big, you know, repository of water. For what? There's an image of a swamp here for foul swampy things for foul toads to 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 un to become a union of and to gender in meaning to have sex in now look at that that's a that's exactly what he's talking about here 
we can make physical love and 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 Desdemona and, and Othello, as I've argued in previous videos, they're not above physical love. Physi spiritual love, true spiritual love, does not negate the, the pleasures of the flesh at all. This is a pleasure of the flesh, and it's spiritual at the same time. But what he's talking about here when he talks about a mere cistern, is my love, is our marriage bed, is our marriage merely a cistern for foul toads to not engender in? Is it merely a matter of prostitution? Are we married for, for nothing else but to enjoy only the, the bestial physical self, do you see? Um, it's, it's really, really lovely, and this makes it very, very tragic because we know what he thinks he has lost, and the tragedy lies in the fact that we know that he hasn't lost it. It's actually there. That love is still there as pure as ever, except in, in his mind. It's all a creation of his corrupted mind. So that back and forth continues throughout the whole scene. I'm not going to go through all of them, of course. Grim as hell, honest, flies and swamp. There's the notion of, of the marriage bed as being a swamp, you see. Sweet, sin, whore, burn. There's hell, an image of hell. Modesty, an image of heaven. The moon is heavenly and, and chaste, a symbol of chastity. Do you see? Body, winds, the bowels of the earth, the minds of the earth. Strumpet means a prostitute. Heaven, strumpet, Christian. It goes, it goes on and on and on. The next thing I want to talk about, however, is this, this really interesting uh, um, uh, repetition of this question. Now, you remember, uh, we talked about this in my previous video, and uh, it, this, this question is first asked by Iago to Cassio way, way back in, in Act 2. Uh, six times, six times in total that this scene, that this question is being asked in some variation, okay, by different people in the play. Uh, now, when uh, something like that is repeated, when an image or a word or a phrase or a question is repeated several times in any work of art, it's something you have to pay attention to because the, uh, the, the writer all obviously has something uh, that he's using it for something or she's using it for something. So I thought about this and, and I, I thought, what could it possibly mean? And in my previous video, I talked about these two things. Um, first of all, I think it's, it's, it's Iago's challenge to himself. Is it possible that I could manipulate Othello like this? Could I do it? That's the psychopath's need for sport and desire to, to have fun manipulating people. I think it's also at a deeper level, I think it's Shakespeare's question to us, uh, is it possible that a psychopath could actually do this kind of damage? And could it happen to you, ladies and gentlemen? And the answer is definitely yes, because we will all encounter psychopaths in our lives. And what this, what drama does is it gives an exaggerated version of what that, uh, of what, of the kind of damage that a psychopath could do. So hopefully we're not going to run into a, an Iago that tears apart uh, you know our entire lives like this, but at a at a at a at a subtler, smaller level, yeah, we will encounter those kind of guys that do damage to us in in some way. Um, what's happening here? Desdemona says, "No, I shall be saved." What? I'm not, are, are you a whore? No, I will be saved. I'm a Christian. I will be saved, and I'm and I'm and I'm, and I'm innocent, and we know that that's true. And then he says, is it possible that someone like you can be saved? Okay, that's, that's at the superficial level. That's what Othello's asking. But because this is an echo of Iago, one thing that's happening, of course, is that everybody says this. It's begun by Iago, but everybody in the play is asking this question, or most people. Most people in this play are asking the same question. That suggests to me that, that Iago's ideas have infected the entire world. It permeates the minds of all DC. So it's not just Othello that's the victim. Everybody falls victim to, to, to this. The other question at an, at an even deeper level, I would say, is that the question is, is it possible for someone to be so wrong? Is it possible for someone as innocent as Desdemona to actually be murdered by someone because of a misunderstanding? Uh, I mean, if you look at the newspapers, tragically, it's true. Uh, innocent people get, get taken out you know, all the time. Um, I think the st statistic is, I think, like 1% of the population uh, are, is a psychopath. So in your life, you've, and it's mostly men, men are most, mostly this kind of psychopaths. I mean, there are crazy women, of course, and crazy women who actually go as far as to murder, but overwhelmingly it's men. At that higher end of the bell curve of psychopathology, it's almost all men. The top 10% of crazy psychopath murderers are men, and that's why the jails are filled with men. That's just a biological uh, fact. Go look it up. So the question is, uh, is it possible for someone as tender and as beautiful and as kind of grotesquely, naively innocent, I suppose. We could argue that too, as someone like Desdemona to be brutally murdered by someone. And the, and the, and the answer, of course, is, you know, look around and, and, and it is true. Um, it's, it's quite sad. So there, there, there's that. Um, this next one is, it goes back to Othello as the insecure outsider. Desdemona says, oh, heaven forgive us. And 
Othello re replies very bitterly, very sarcastically, I cry you mercy then. Oh, I, oh, forgive me. I made a mistake. I thought you were the cunning whore of Venice that married with Othello. Do you hear the bitterness here? Do you hear the bitterness? It's the bitterness of an outsider. Remember, like a good storyteller, Shakespeare is echoing back to the beginning of the play and towards, well, not the beginning, but the, towards the beginning of the play, Iago, one of the incepting tools, one of the manipulations that, that Iago uses to convince Othello that Desdemona is being, uh, is cheating on him, is to, to, to play on Othello's insecurity as an outsider, as a non-Venetian. Iago says very explicitly, look, look, man, I, I, I love you, bro, you, but you don't understand these Venetian women. You're an outsider here. I know these Venetian women, and they, this is how they operate here. So that's, again, that's the voice of Iago that we hear speaking, do you see? Um, it, it's, it, it's the insecure outsider. It reminds us, the viewers, of how it was possible that a noble man and a competent man and a confident man like or seemingly confident man like Othello is able to 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 fall so low there's the theme of peripatia the change in fortune do you see um, just to finish up this little bit here uh, with, the, with in terms of the nobility versus baseness theme that we've been talking about he 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 sends Emilia away in the same tone that he 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 he, he greeted Desdemona earlier it's the prostitution John and Madam trio do you see he says we have finished our course the John has had his pleasures with the prostitute. Here's money for your pains. Do you see how crude that is? I pray you turn the key and keep your counsel. Like a good madam that you are, you you know you you keep your mouth shut. You know it, it's there's the there's the idea, there's the image again of the marriage bed, marriage in loose quotes here, of course, because it's the ho the sleazy hotel room, mm. as the as a as a cistern for toads to breed in. Do you see? As opposed to what we just saw, as opposed to the sacred marriage bed in the fountain of life that gives birth to 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 the universe. Uh, yeah, very 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 sad. So that whole little bit here is based around that that uh, that theme of nobility versus baseness, language revealing character. It's Iago's voice. That's Iago's voice. That's money. Do you see? That's that's Iago's voice as we as we've talked about just today. A, a total alienation, annihilation of the self of poor old Othello. And then Desdemona is alone with Amelia, and things cool down again a bit. Amelia asks Desdemona how things are going, and, and and Desdemona doesn't really have an answer. She's absolutely stunned. She has answer, have have I none? But that but what shall should go by water? So those are tears. There's the image of tears. But she also mentions uh, the the wedding bed, and that's the, uh, the 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 sheets, the wedding sheets. So that that calls to mind uh, what we just talked about in terms of the holy marriage versus the cistern for the engendering of toads. Do you see? Uh, this this is the lovely promise. Prithee tonight, lay on my bed my wedding sheets. Now that those were important in Elizabethan times. There's the wedding sheets. They're sheets that are given to a couple as 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 that holy altar. In in the in in the old mythic notion, as I mentioned, that that the the wedding bed is an altar. It's an altar. It's a sacred union that shall fructify the universe. That's what it is. And so here's a call to that. A plaintive call to that, and it's a tragic call because we know that it's not going to—it's not going to work because it's been corrupted. It—it it, it is now a cistern for the breeding of toads. It's—it's—it's it's, it's pretty tragic. So there's the image of water, um, the fructification of the universe, and there's the image of the holy altar, what should be the holy altar of the wedding bed, DC. Um, so that—that—that's—that's that's kind of interesting. Um, then Emilia exits and comes back with a, with with Iago, and then they all try to console her. She's in tears, or she's. You know, she's stunned. She's in tears. And there's a few interesting things here uh, about Desdemona and about, more importantly, of here about, about Amelia. It's quite interesting. Anyway, so, so she says, she, and she's, in, she's absolutely stunned. She says, I am a child to chiding. I'm a child to this kind of abuse. I don't know what's going on here. I, I, I'm innocent. I've never experienced this kind of abuse. I don't know what's going on. Now, how do we judge, how do we judge Desdemona for this? I've talked in previous videos about uh, the fact that Emilia may be resentful of Desdemona's absolutely childishly naive happiness. If you have a friend who is happy, happy, happy all the time, and you're not, that's going to breed resentment. And no matter how good a person you try to be, that ugh, at some point you're just going to want to poke that friend in the eye and say, you know what? Life is not so happy for the, all the rest of us, do you see? Don't be so happy. 
I think that that's why Emilia gives the handkerchief to Iago. She tries to sabotage Desdemona's happiness because of that resentment. She sees Desdemona as a fool, as a fool, and it, and she's not wrong. She's a naive Desdemona is a naive, spoiled princess. I think that that's actually true. Um, there's an excess of goodness. An excess of goodness is foolishness. Do you see? It means you have no shadow. It means you can't defend yourself against the monsters who are out there. And there are monsters out there, of course. Naivete, gullibility is one of the major themes of here. And we see Rodrigo being gullible. We see Cassio being gullible. Do you see? The lack of shadow, a lack of a lack of an understanding of the world's evil. And then when you encounter that evil, you have no defenses against it. So in that case, we can actually blame Desdemona as being the agent of her own destruction here. I don't think it's unfair to do that. I think it's unfair to and, and cruel to wish her her destruction but we have to forgive Amelia for those slips of just <clears throat> oh, I can't stand looking at her being so childishly naively joyously happy all the time because the world is not like that you see so Amelia tries to bring her down by giving the handkerchief and sabotaging that happiness so yeah, there she is. She's naive. She's self-aware, though. She's smart. She's self-aware. She says, yeah, you're right. I'm very, very naive. I, this is a schooling for me, she says. It, it's a bitter, bitter lesson, of course. Um, then we get some more interesting stuff about Amelia. She says here, uh, um, now remember, Iago's in the room as well. And she says, I think I know what's going on. I think some busy and insinuating rogue, some codging, cozying slave to get some career promotion has devised some kind of slander against you, Desdemona. Well, that's a that's a straight up plot summary of the whole plot of the whole play. Do you see? That's Iago, and Iago responds very defensively. He says, "Fie! There's no such man." And here's our famous phrase. Actually, I should add that because I think that's another variation of what we what we've been taught, what we just talked about. It's, it is impossible, he says. So. What's happening here with Amelia, I believe, is, 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 is she is bitter, she is cynical, uh, as we've talked about. But here we see her em the, the appro she's approaching her emergence as a complete independent self. She's been cowering behind uh, her husband, her bullying husband throughout the whole play, do you see? And here she's starting to feel things spinning out of control. Quite, quite rightly, she's feeling things spinning out of control. She senses the tension. She senses, she senses that her actions of giving that handkerchief to, to Iago may have caused uh, some, some real, real problems. And so she's starting to, to develop a backbone. It comes too late in the same way that, her, that, that Friar Lawrence's backbone comes too late. If you go back and watch my videos about Romeo and Juliet, she, she emerges as a good person, but, but her, tra her, her, her tragic mistake is very, very tragic. I think she's getting angry at herself here. And I think that she's actually suspicious of Iago. I think she's, depending on the film or the stage version that you watch, the director might choose to have the actress kind of look askance at Iago when she says lines like this, because she says another line here, the same thing. The Moor has been abused by some villainous knave, and of course the villainous knave is Iago. We all know that. That's dramatic irony. But when Shakespeare pours it on so thick, all this dramatic irony is being poured on so thick, it might suggest that there's more to it than just the dramatic irony that Emilia is still not, she's not confessing to Desdemona. You know what? I gave the handkerchief uh, uh, to, to, um, uh, to, to, to Iago. She's not confessing. So she's still, she's still the flawed hero, but she's starting to emerge. She's starting to piece things together. And eventually at the very, very end, of course, she's the one who, who, who reveals all. She's the great revealer. Now, it comes too late, as I mentioned, very, very tragically late. Uh, but, but she's an interesting character in that regard. She's not just a mousy. She's not just a mousy, bullied wife. She comes into her own tragically too late. Um, so here, here, is, here is more evidence of Desdemona as pure. Now, I want to talk about this. Now, I just talked about her purity as being foolish and childishly and reprehensible in some way, do you see, and worthy of our contempt in some way, that naivete. Here, I want to argue for the opposite. Here, I want to argue that we do need goodness in the world and that she is, she is an avatar of that goodness. She says here, they're arguing back and forth. She says, I will always love, no matter what my husband does, I will love him, love him, love him. Unswerving love from a woman, unswerving love from a man. Ah, it's rare and it is, it's, it's noble. And it's something that we want to believe exists in the world. And look at this lovely poetry that Shakespeare puts in her mouth. Unkindness may do much. 
and his unkindness may defeat my life, but never taint my love. Hmm? Hmm? Don't you want that? Well, there's language. There's the beautiful language. And we've just encountered a barrage, barrage of ugliness, ugly language, ugly imagery all throughout this, a cistern for the breeding of toads. It's awful. And then we encounter something as lovely as this, and we're rooting for her. We're rooting for Desdemona. We're rooting for that goodness to exist in the world. And just previously, we were scornful of it. Now there's, now there's some masterful storytelling. Very, very interesting stuff. Love is the redeemer. The appearance versus reality. This is the reality of her. She is this. She is the, 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 the universe fructifying positive feminine force. Lovely. Again, Iago just tries to calm her down and says, you know, he's just, it's just, you know, there's a lot of, he, he's got a lot on his mind and that's what's driving him crazy. And uh, then the trumpets blow and Desdemona and Emilia leave. And then the buffoon Rodrigo comes in and we see there's a parallel here between Rodrigo and Emilia. Rodrigo, of course, uh, is, is, is the bullied uh, 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 gull, gullible gull. He's the bullied gull in a similar way that Emilia is the bullied uh, wife. Now here we just saw Emilia is starting to emerge, starting to develop some backbone, some courage to speak what's on her mind and we're just wishing that she would get to it. And here we see the same thing. Here we see Rodrigo doing the same thing. He, he, he confronts Iago and says, look, you've cheated me. I've wasted all of my means, all of my money, and I've gotten nothing in return. Uh, you, you're, you're cheating me. And, and he says, Iago says, go away, go away, go away. I'm not even listening to you until Rodrigo says, okay, I will make myself known to Desdemona. I'm going to approach Desdemona myself, and if she will return my jewels, if you've given her the jewels that I've given to you to give to her, then fine, I'll go ask her for them. I will give over my suit. I will give up my suit and repent my unlawful solicitation. I'll ask forgiveness. And if she doesn't give me those jewels, then I know you've stolen them, and I will have satisfaction from you, DC. So he's starting to, de to, to develop some backbone here. He is the gull. He is gullible. He's, he's got a weak, weak shadow, but here we see him struggling in the same way that we saw, and we want him to struggle. We want him to smack Iago down and reveal. We want to reveal what's been going on. We want him to reveal what's going on, but he fails in the same way that, uh, that uh, Emilia fails. Uh, he's struggling, and we see, we, we see Iago now, when he, once he realizes that, uh, that whoa, wait, wait a minute here, Rodrigo might have some backbone, Rodrigo might reveal me that's when he pays attention and he kicks into his old psychopathic manipulative self and that's what he does here look what he says why now i see there's some courage in you you've got some backbone after all previously up here he says very well whatever go to whatever i'm not even gonna listen to you and he starts to walk away and in the film version that i watch uh, uh that i that i like the old one ian mckellen one uh he he actually just walks away you see uh, and 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 but he has to turn around now because he knows that that that, that uh, he might be revealed. So uh, parallel characters, uh, the victims, parallel gullible characters, um, um, Rodrigo and Emilia. I don't think Rod I don't think Emilia is gullible though, but she is bullied right in the same way. It may not look like I've been working on your behalf, but I have been, and I have a plan to help you get Desdemona, and you shall enjoy her tomorrow night. So there's some crude language there as well. And so Rodrigo is, is the gull, and he says, is it within reason? So he's immediately perked up. And here's the questioning again. The psychopath can get, get the other person to seek their own destruction, remember, by asking these questions. And so it works. Um, so the plan is, as I mentioned at the beginning of this video, is that um, uh, uh, Desdemona and Othello are due to leave Cyprus, but we have to stop that from happening. And the way we can stop that from happening is by 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 getting rid of Othello's replacement as the leader in Cyprus, and that is Cassio. So he, Iago says, we can make it impossible for, uh, for Desdemona to leave if we knock out Cassio's brains, do you see? And Rodrigo says, and that you would have me do? And he says, yes, if you're brave enough, if you're brave enough, you see, he's, he's, he's manipulating uh, uh, Rodrigo uh, with flattery. I see that you're brave, remember? He says, I saw, I see that you're brave. You've got, there's metal in you yet. And if you are brave, you'll kill Cassio. And then there's that word, you will be satisfied. That's what Rodrigo started this whole dialogue by. I will be satisfied. And Iago cleverly turns it back on him. And that was Five Quote Shakespeare, Act 4, Scene 2. Come back for my next video, Act 4, Scene 3. Thanks for watching.